oh well, this will just be like one of those Ebola things, like it'll come and go just in, a, in one ear out the other basically. The meet might get canceled, but you know, in my head I'm like, oh, it won't, it won't get canceled. They're not gonna cancel the national meet. And while we were flying is when everything got canceled. I've been quarantined since Saturday, and today is now Tuesday. I, I believe my number one obligation is to keep our students safe. At first I didn't have any symptoms, and then she told me that she started having symptoms, so I had to go t get tested. COVID-19 has impacted my job in ways that it's really even hard to quantify. With coronavirus now showing up in Minnesota, MSUM has now canceled its study abroad program and international trips for the next 30 days. Good evening, everyone. Minnesota Governor Tim Walz has issued a stay at home order. With a national emergency now declared, in-person classes remain canceled. All athletic events are postponed and online learning at MSUM will now begin. Good evening, everyone. MSUM has now joined NDSU and other area colleges in suspending classes. Graduation at MSUM and the entire Minn State system has been canceled. MSUM is moving all classes online after the Thanksgiving break. Okay, I have um, noon here, so I am going to get going. Uh, welcome again to Intro to Mass Media, COM 101. Again, for those that are willing to turn on your cameras, it's very helpful to me to know that people are actually out there. So if you're willing to do that, um, appreciate that. A couple of announcements. Um, the, the exam, I did move it up a class period. Um, so it will be on Monday, November 9th. Uh, let me turn your mic off, please. COVID-19 has impacted my job in ways that it's really even hard to quantify. Had you come to me a year ago and said, a virus is going to spread across the whole world and we're all going to have to wear masks and 200,000 people are going to die in the United States alone, I'd be like, okay, what movie are we producing here? My name is Chris Walker. I teach lens-based media in communication and journalism. I, I teach because I really love working with students to that privilege of being with somebody when they want to know something that you know and you can help them understand that. And when they get it, that just the, the light pops on over their head, oh my gosh, that as, a, as a professor, that's my dopamine. To suddenly go from decades in front of people in live classrooms um, to emailing ideas back and forth, and if I'm lucky, a phone conversation. And we're almost done, okay? I mean, this one's gonna be short. And we're not hold your breath done. All right. It's basically you run away so you can, you know, live to fight another day. Let's talk about quarantine. So, my name is David Nibby. I am a senior here at MSUM. I contacted the dean um, and talked to her directly, which was good to talk to someone directly about this. And she gave me the instructions to go into quarantine and then potentially be here for 14 days, um, which is a lot as a college student. Um, you have to sacrifice a lot of things to be in quarantine for 14 days. Since then, I've just been leaving sticky notes because they give you sticky notes and a Sharpie to leave around for leaving notes for people who drop off your food or um, if you need like mail or something, you can leave a note for someone that stops on the floor. Good news, I heard from the Dean of Students and that I'm able to leave quarantine now because of my situation. Um, they told me I'm in the all clear, so. I'll just go back to life and hopefully I don't get sent back here anytime soon.
Hello again. It's David. Two months later, after that first incident, I'm back in quarantine. Like how well I knew them? Or like what I knew about what happened to them? I'm actually enjoying this quarantine because I have been so gosh darn busy. The, the craziest part is that I've actually been thinking I'd prefer to just test positive at this point. Like my age and my demographics, I would most likely not have a, a serious case. Um, I'd go into isolation. I'd have those days to just focus on myself. I can relax. Um, it's kind of the most morbid vacation um, to take, and it's a really weird standpoint. Just some advice I'd give to you all. Um, keep your bubbles small, wear your masks, make sure that if um, something like this comes up that you have a plan. Stay safe out there, wear your, wear your masks. That's just, just wear your masks. Okay, thank you, bye. My name is Yvonne Grismer. I've been a cook at Moorhead State for 36 years. Right, right? Everybody's cold, I think, and impatient. It's like, I mean, we're cook to order, and they're, they don't seem like they want to wait. And, they, and their eyes are full. Took out almost half of the tables, it seems, right? And four to a table. It says five, but they're trying to keep it at four. The masks, which are bad. I mean, that's the biggest thing. Because not seeing, you know, seeing people and their faces is to get, you know, how you know people, what they, what they eat, what they like. How's that? Good? All right. You better enjoy. We get, we get thank yous and, you know, good work and, but it's not the same. Not at all. Um, I guess working, <laughs> being able to work, you know, coming back to work every day, um, seeing people and nice people, working with people. I mean, we have we have a lot of fun at work, and I think that's what it's all about. I'm Jill Sapransky. I'm an accounting major. I am a senior and I played on the golf team. We were in the airport in Arizona on spring break trip. Um, it sounded like everything was shutting down. We didn't know if we would even like get on our plane. And that's when we were getting emails from Doug about everything going on. And we got to play our tournament. So at least we were on our way home from that. And while we were flying is when everything got canceled. And there really wasn't like when we went down, it wasn't a lot of questions. Like we were just going, COVID was far away. and. Six days later, it was, everything was done. The airport was just like weird. Like everything just was like, get on the airplane. We just want to get home. That was the most important thing. That's what Doug was texting, Doug and Chad were texting our coaches about was like, get on the plane, get home. That's what we needed to do then. But like masks weren't a thing. I actually <laughs> was on the end of influenza B. So I had a cough at the time and nobody knew what COVID was like, so that was tough. So I sat in the airplane holding my breath the whole time. But <laughs> so spring season in golf is our competition season, but our fall season actually holds the bulk of our meets. We play about six meets in fall and only two or three in spring. So the spring, it was just kind of a lot of waiting game. I was really hoping that we'd just get an answer right away. Like, can we play, can we not play? And it was a lot of waiting, just a big waiting game. So once fall got canceled, it was almost like a relief to finally have an answer, not just on the nerves all the time. I mean, I just think COVID took away a lot of the little moments. Like first thing that I missed was like the first week of school with our freshmen. That's when you go in and you ask all the crazy things about college and the freshmen just get to like learn the team, learn what it's like. And a lot of freshmen didn't get that. Um, I miss all the athletes, like the big athlete picture is just, a big loss um, and then with golf like I just 
wanted to have a moment where I knew my season ended, but there's no closure with COVID ending it. You just ended and you didn't know. So from the beginning, at what point did we start worrying about the uh, COVID-19? Well, uh, you know, when I started worrying about it personally, it might be might be a bit different than when um, sure. when we realized, you know, the impact it was going to have on the university. I, I was actually traveling okay. uh, in late February, early March, and was definitely worried. So it was, you know, very early March when we started to realize it would have an impact, and you know from there things just really snowballed it just right. became clear it was going to affect everything for a lot of the summer i think we hoped at least that at some point in the fall we'd be able to go back to fully face to face even if we weren't there by the first day of classes in august and the closer we got to the start of the semester the more obvious it was that that wasn't going to happen and now of course we're worried about the winter time period and what that's going to mean for the virus. I've heard from students, some students directly, that they're struggling. You know, they don't, it's hard for them to feel motivated when right. their classes are all online. And that's not why they chose MSUM. That's not what they wanted. Even going way back to that very first decision to cancel study abroad in March. I mean, that was a heartbreaking decision right. because I knew what that meant for our faculty and students. but. I believe my number one obligation is to keep our students safe. But beyond that, I, I think just the general sense of isolation and anxiety, you know, that we're probably all dealing with. Um, not sleeping very well and, uh, you know, all of that is just hard. So how has COVID affected you personally? My husband is in the late stages of Alzheimer's. Um, Okay. And he's in a memory care facility. So I would say the biggest impact on me personally has been that I haven't been able to visit him because of course, assisted living and nursing homes and memory care units are really high risk environments. And so that's been the hardest thing for me personally is not, okay. is not being able to visit my husband. Taylor. I'm a photojournalism major, so I do a lot with the cameras and the interviews. <laughs> so I've been quarantined four times. Um, it started out in late June, early July, because my family, um, my uncle got sick from COVID. He has epilepsy, so it was kind of a big deal for him to get COVID and he ended up passing away from it. I didn't know, we didn't know it was COVID at first. Um, we knew he was sick. We didn't really like think of COVID at the time because this was like before everyone was thinking about COVID, I guess. And um, he lives on the, he lived on the reservation. And so it's not very prominent out there because they're pretty strict, surprisingly, about that stuff. But, um, yeah, so he had epilepsy, so he like struggled with stuff like that a lot. So I kind of just assumed that it was like seizure gone bad. Um, but then I later found out that it was a seizure brought on by COVID. And yeah, he was the youngest out of um, the siblings. So it was hard to see everybody like having to bury their younger brother, essentially. I ended up getting COVID um, early no, like late August, early September. And once I got tested was pretty much when the symptoms started. Um, I had pretty much, it felt like weights on my chest for a while and it's, I really struggled to breathe, but it was like more painful than anything. It just felt like a constant pressure. Like it even hurt to talk. Quarantine was hard for many reasons. Um, it was really hard to be alone for that long, especially like four times. <laughs> um, it definitely takes a toll on your mental health. 
Um, I really struggled with like being away from my family, especially. Um, you don't really think about that stuff when it's like everything's normal. <laughs> you don't think about how much time you spend with like other people and social gatherings and like your family and stuff. And then when I'm not allowed to be around them, it was like, I just felt this, like, I felt really alone. My uncle was very kind. He was a very giving man. And so I think about that often now. Uh, I never really paid much attention to it. Like growing up, he, my uncle worked at a junkyard and he would like find things he thought we would like and bring it to us. <laughs> Like, I told him I wanted to be a spy when I was five years old, and so he found an old tape recorder at the junkyard and was like, here, for your interviews. <laughs> so I think about that often, and so I'm trying to be more giving and more humble, I guess. I'm trying to think about, like, other people more, and that's, I feel like we all need to do during this pandemic in general. like. It's not just us anymore. We need to start thinking of other people. And so I think he would have wanted that, especially during this pandemic. I'm Angela Beaton. I work here at the library. I'm a library technician. Uh, I work part-time up here in the archives. There haven't been a whole lot of in instances like this. Um, I think the floods would be the most similar, uh, as in something that kind of came up quickly and then people were sent away from the campus quickly. As far as like the floods go, I was just reviewing some of that material before you guys came and it looked very similar <laughs> to what happened here in the spring. Uh, there'd be an email that went out, okay, there's no class on Monday. And then, okay, now there's also no class on Tuesday. Uh, okay, there's no class all week, <laughs> and uh, then also there's no class all of next week. Classes were canceled, and that seems to be the most common way that they've dealt with these kind of situations. Um, we don't have a lot of information about what they did during the influenza epidemic. Uh, it was very overshadowed by World War One. A lot of those records from before 1930 were lost. Uh, in 1930, Old Main burned down, which was the main big building that most of the classes were held in. Uh, so that would have been another instance, but they only stopped classes for about a week. Uh, the following week, they were back in session. Uh, but we do know that they did turn uh, some of the dorms into uh, quarantine areas, places for sick students, and that they did have some local nurses on standby, like on the campus to kind of administer medicine and things to people. It'll be really interesting to see kind of how we look back on this. Um, as far as us in the archives, what we're trying to collect are like people's stories. Uh, we would love to know more about how it impacted individuals and things like that. Uh, we've been gathering pictures of um, like signs and things around town, pictures of empty shelves. Uh, we've been trying to just kind of keep a record of like complete disruption <laughs> that's happened. And I think it will be interesting to see kind of how future people look back on it and what they take away from it, I guess. Ethan Gerbig. I'm majoring in biology with an emphasis in pre-health and medical sciences. I have a minor in strength and conditioning and I play offensive line for the MSUM Dragons. One of the vivid realizations that COVID was a little more serious than we imagined was on my way back from, from spring break, I remember it's about an eight hour car ride so I like to fill the time with calling some friends and I called one of my buddies Griffin from back home and we just kind of started talking back and forth about it. And he's like, yeah, uh, he goes to Iowa State. He said they just canceled the class for, I think it was two or three weeks at the time. And we kind of joked about it and we're like, oh, well, 
this will just be like one of those Ebola things. Like it'll come and go just in, a, in one ear, out the other basically. But then I remember a few weeks later, we canceled class and that's when I was like, yeah, this is probably a little more serious than I anticipated it would be. This is, I think, one of our most prominent years. We had a lot to look forward to. We had a lot of returning seniors. And I think we all just tried to keep pushing each other and motivating each other. I think a big factor of keeping us motivated was just each other. Uh, that was probably the biggest driving factor of why everyone was competing in this off season. And when we heard the news, it was, it was pretty devastating, to be honest. Uh, it's still something I think about. Some of my oldest memories are playing football. So it's definitely something that's going to be hard to let go of. Biggest feeling was probably just defeat, uh, knowing there was really nothing that anyone could do. Um, one of the hardest parts was just kind of getting dragged along through the whole process of we never really knew like if the season was canceled or what everyone was thinking. It just kind of felt I, I felt kind of blindsided, I guess you could say. Um, unfortunately, I'm graduating in the fall, so uh, it's probably not going to happen for me. Um, I know we're starting work ups, workouts here soon, but I've, I've kind of put the, the football to rest in my head just because I've, I've kind of made peace with it that I'm no longer a college athlete. And One thing that I think is kind of hindering MSUM's ability to play football is the uh, NCAA rule where you would have to get tested 72 hours in advance, whereas the high school level doesn't have that. Um, but NCAA does have that, and it would just be, I think the, the cost on the school itself just doesn't make it realistic. Everyone has that mentality of like, oh, you never know, like what play is gonna be your last, and it's the most like corny, cheesy, whatever, but a lot of things. Probably do a lot of things to play right now. I don't know. We never had a manual for COVID-19, so we quickly made a manual of how we can do and run um, counseling services to the best of our ability. Some of the things that have been a little bit different is we're still um, providing um, counseling services via Zoom because our offices are not six feet, so we're not, some of our offices are not big enough, and we just don't have the space to do that. So that's been a little bit challenging as well because we're not, we're not face to face with some of our students, which we would like to be. We've seen an increase in especially the social anxiety piece and feeling a lot of students feeling isolated. I would say students, um, for the most part, were feeling a lot of the stress and the anxiety, especially too of being home. I think it's hard when they, especially if they get that red, that red light on their phone that says they can't come to campus, I think that's really stressful for them and they're trying to figure out how they can get their work done. We're seeing students come through the doors that are just struggling a little bit with that and trying to make friends and meet new people. And it also has made us think of different ways that we can provide services and also different avenues and therapeutic modalities that we can utilize. Um, what, what we're seeing too is a lot of information on resiliency. So I'm going to explain how I manage things, having classes, uh, like online classes and the COVID. I decided to go out at the downtown uh, on Saturday night. I'm pretty sure that I got something that night because after Saturday, I have like uh, Sunday, Monday, till Thursday, I was home because I was usually working from home and my classes are all online, so I don't remember that I went out anywhere and I met with anyone on those five days. On Thursday evening, I feel like I have a sore throat, and later that night, I got a fever, and next day, that goes to 104, and later that night, I was kind of unconscious, and my roommate, he took me to the hospital. We went to the hospital. Uh, unfortunately, that was an emergency, but uh, we still have to wait for two hours to get a bed. And I don't remember most of the things, but I only have flashes. So <clears throat> they took two of my tests and they both came positive for COVID-19. And then after, that was a Friday night and on Sunday, uh, I started having some issues and I got hospitalized that night again. 
Unfortunately, they don't have much beds. Uh, that was the same time when we only have 20 beds left in a whole North Dakota state. So every time when I went to the hospital, to the ER, I have to wait at least two hours to get a bed. They gave me, they took my x-rays and everything, but fortunately, I never had any lungs issues, but my fe I, I had a straight nine days of 104 fever. I was throwing up all night, all day, and my <coughs> headache was just killing me. That was worst. That was kind of worst part of my life. I was kind of unsure that I'm gonna survive or not, so I just called my dad and explained it to him. But I cannot because my mom, she is that far and she cannot have that thing like instantly. So we lied to her mom. I just say like I have like just a normal fever, but not a COVID. And my dad was upset for like all that time. And as I said, like the only family that I had was my roommate and my neighbors. They're my friends too. It's been a month and a half and I still have a weakness and I'm trying to recover. I talked to the doctor and he said it will take at least three months to get fully recovered from that. So I'm taking supplements and juices and trying to recover as soon as possible. My name is Brandon Nofsey. I am a senior music education major. With the masks and all of these other like smaller inconveniences, I'm not really bothered by it. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to A, graduate, and B, stay here, as long as we can stay here to have the experience that we're having. We are on this lovely Hanson stage for a lot of our rehearsing, which is an uh, interesting challenge for everybody. I think being far away from each other to, you know, be with the COVID gui guidelines is an interesting challenge in and of itself. I guess everybody has the idea in their head that their, that their recital is going to be, you know, a big thing. All their friends are going to come. It's going to go great. Just still a lot of uncertainty. I don't know if I'm going to have any family members that are going to be able to come. I actually had different repertoire picked out before all this happened. Without being able to rehearse for like five months straight, we just couldn't make it happen as, as well as we wanted to. The thing that COVID has taught me the most about music is that it, it requires other people. sixth grade band level in music and I would be I'd be happy as a clam. I'm just excited to I'm excited to be with people again. Uh, my name is Chris Cook. I am a senior and I high jump for the track team at Minnesota State University Moorhead. Yeah, so I ended up qualifying. Uh, my second time qualifying actually was at NDSU, and I jumped seven feet and a half inch at that meet. That was a pretty big deal. That was really fun, really fun meet. Yep. Yeah. 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 That away, man. Yeah, so we got to Alabama, I think. Um, we got to Birmingham, Alabama, I think it was Wednesday. So, you know, we get there, we. we get the feel for the area for a couple of days and warm up, practice, kind of just, you know, do our run-throughs. And the day before we're supposed to compete, we're actually at the race car museum. And then that's, you know, we're kind of just filling, filling it out, having fun. And we get the news that, you know, coronavirus has hit and it's an actual thing. And you know, that's the first time I've ever heard about it. And so we were kind of just like, oh, now, the meet might get canceled, but you know, in my head, I'm like, oh, it won't, it won't get canceled. They're not gonna cancel the national meet, you know what I mean? And then uh, towards the end of being there that day, my coach says, yeah, they just canceled the meet. And I'm just like, yeah, that's not funny. Don't joke like that, you know what I mean? Like, you're already here. And mind you, this is a day before we we're supposed to compete. You know, my mom was out there. She was actually on her way out there. Um, she was actually turned around in Chicago they made the decision to cancel indoor and outdoor at the same time. I got back to Moorhead in July, early July. 
We had summer workouts, so I, I, I did attend summer workouts. Um, but other than that, Nimzik was basically off limits. Yeah, things were definitely weird, you know? Nobody really thought we wouldn't be able to use. Like, when I go to Nimzik, I call it the office, you know what I mean? Like, that's where work gets done, that's where work gets put in. Right now, practice is, don't really have official practice right now, it's kind of voluntary. It's hard to be patient, but I understand being patient, you know what I mean? So it's like, you ever, you know, parents are sometimes like, hey, if you don't eat this piece of candy right now, you can have two. And, if, and for me, it's like, okay, I might not be able to use Nimzik right now, but I'd rather wait and use Nimzik to make sure it's safe and have a season than not have a season at all, you know? So it's, it's kind of bittersweet. <laughs> good job, man. Nice uh, job. Congrats. Oh, yeah. That was a good one. That was a good day, man. Oh, man. Yeah, we just got these new rags. <laughs> Both of us are to the press with these guys. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Breaking news tonight on the search for a COVID vaccine. Pfizer says it will announce results proving a safe and 95% effective vaccine. A coronavirus update. Yet another pharmaceutical company has announced it too will ask the FDA for emergency approval of its vaccine. A developing story tonight, both North Dakota and Minnesota are expected to get the coronavirus vaccine any day now. Special coolers are in place in the region as public health waits for the green light.